afternoon. Uh, it's good to see that you're, uh, the majority is still here, right? So there's still some people to talk to, some people to address, right? Um, the funny thing is, this talk didn't exist until an hour ago. Um, <laughs> that's agile, right? People always use agile in the wrong way, but this probably isn't really agile. It's just stupid. But um, so I got so much material left from this morning, and um, so I combined it with some stuff from other talks, some new stuff too. So to be quite honest, I don't know exactly what's the agenda, but I'll be talking about stuff like micro teams, um, shorter cycles, going beyond agile, uh, talking about autonomy in teams, um, stuff like that. So it's basically more team oriented than this morning, which was highly code oriented, right? So, um, and I'm going to talk about the innovators dilemma, which is a very interesting, uh, uh, well, very interesting dilemma that a lot of the companies that I work for tend to sort of meet and um, uh, either they're doomed at that point or they step over themselves and reinvent themselves. So um, I'm going to be talking about that too. So let's see if I can get my pointer to work. It seems to zoom now. So, so, let's, so let, let's start simple, right? Let's start by buying coffee. So in the Netherlands where I'm from, um, I took this picture at my local supermarket. And, and the funny thing is that um, with coffee, it's pretty easy. The higher the quality of the code, the higher the cost, right? That is a pattern that we all have in mind. Um, and it, it, you can go further with it, right? You can say like, what if I'm buying a new camera, right? The more expensive the camera is, the more features you have, the better the lens, the better, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that is what we expect. Also, if you would buy a car, this is a picture I took at a secondhand uh, Audi store um, near where I live. Um, the more money you spend on a car, usually the better it gets. Um, I saw, I was on the highway yesterday here and there was a Ferrari passing and it was like, shh, 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 but, well, it's a Ferrari, right? So I guess you're allowed if you have a Ferrari to do that here. But anyway, so the more expensive the stuff gets, the better the quality. That's what you expect. The trouble with software is that it doesn't really work that way. So this is a, a well-known uh, diagram that says, well, basically, um, you can try to look for an optimum, right? So depending on how much money you want to spend on something, um, it, it sort of depends how many features you got in the product that you're buying, right? So if you have like a limited amount to spend on coffee, you're not going to buy the most expensive coffee. That means you will agree with having a slightly lesser quality because that is the budget you want to spend for it. Same goes for cameras, the same goes for cars. Um, software router is different. Software, in software basically you could say that quality can mean many things, right? Um, a lot more than in most products. So it, you can talk about um, stability, functional completeness, uh, how, it, how it's performing, how it uses resources, the capacity, uh, whether or not you can learn it, whether it's operable, whether it's user friendly, um, how mature is the stuff, how available. So there's lots of aspects to the quality. As a result, you cannot say that, uh, literally, that uh, um, if you spend more money on something, uh, on software, that it actually becomes better. Because um, software quality is actually very much intangible. This, by the way, is an introduction to my team. Um, I had um, the marketing officer make this picture so you can see my team. Um, and um, <laughs> this is in the morning, right, when they're still happy. Um, and. Um, <laughs> This is, this is before I start shouting to them. No, just kidding. So, so the problem is with software is always that you need to find the balance. And that's a balance between quality on the one hand and price on the other hand, right? And it's about stability versus how cheap can something be. Well, let's say, for instance, that you, um, that you, you have to uh, write a mobile app for something like, I don't know what, flight information or whatever you're trying to do, or uh, a chat GBT um, uh, UI you could build, right? Um, then the question is, if I can build it really rapidly and I can put it in the marketplace really, really soon, that is probably good, right? So in that case, in the short term, the low quality and the fast uh, uh, delivery is actually quite important. However, you could say that most software that we build is not like that, like throwaway software. Because most of the software that we build needs to last for years, right? So um, imagine if you're in a large bank, for instance. Large banks in the, in the Netherlands, and it's probably the same here, 
they have software running in production that is over 50 years old, right? And they still maintain it. What if they would have built that software, given the fact, oh, let's deliver it fast and we'll fix it later, right? They couldn't because it needs to run for years and for years and for years. So the balance between quality and speed is very hard in software. So that is where we need to run into, right? So this is the problem that we then run into. What if we build it quickly and we deliver it quickly, we put it in the marketplace out there, um, and then we start solving stuff? You can always make the choices about speed versus quality, right? You can say, you know what, I'm not going to write any unit tests. I'm just going to put it out there because my code just works. By the way, nobody's code just works. Also not mine, right? But there's no exception to that. And you get into something which is called technical debt. Now, the phrase technical debt was coined by a guy called Ward Cunningham. By the way, he's the inventor of the wiki. Um, and he says, well, shipping first time code is like going into debt. A little debt speeds development so long as it is paid back promptly with refactoring. So it's okay to make a deliberate choice about the quality of what you deliver. It doesn't always have to be the highest grade. To give you an idea, um, as I told this morning, we have this quarterly sales called, called a HUD, um, and we totally read it, all the software that is required to run a HUD. And we didn't know whether we would actually make the deadline. The deadline was actually, it started last Wednesday, so this Wednesday that just gone, at 12 o'clock. I was actually just landing in Hong Kong airport, and my team had to start up the hunt at midnight, right? And I just landed, and I talked to them and said, it's okay, and I'm like, okay, good. But it wasn't finished. The software that we built was not feature complete. It was good enough to get it into production. We had all the unit tests running that were running, but we were missing some features. We put it out anyway because it was stable enough to go there. But we still needed to build another, a number of features. We built them actually during the day. And we built them, or actually my team did, I was here. But, uh, um, so we built them during the fact that the, the, the first version was already running in production. And still, the hunt is over now because it takes two days. Still, we have some features that we want to implement. We're not going to do it now because we don't need it now, right? So that's the question you always need to ask yourself. So you can always ask those questions. Now, the trouble is with technical debt, so with stuff you leave behind, is that if that is functional and you leave out a number of functions or small features, that's okay, right? Because nobody will notice until you deploy those to production too. But if it's technical, if it is stuff that you should really, or you think you should really have done better, like the quality of your code, like having a, a higher percentage of test coverage, like making sure that it fits the architecture that you use for everything else you build, you need to make other decisions. And Ward Cunningham then says, well, the danger occurs when the debt is not repaid. Um, every minute spent on code that is not quite right for the programming test of the moment counts as an interest on the debt. So basically, if you don't do the stuff that you really should have done, that becomes more expensive because over time, the debt will actually grow. And you can see that as interest because the longer you wait with repairing something or making it better, uh, the more expensive it gets. And that is not a linear graph, actually. So what, uh, um, uh, what happens is that, in the end, you get to this point, right? Entire engineering organizations can be brought to a standstill under the debt load of an unfactored implementation, object-oriented or otherwise. doesn't really matter, right? So whether you do this in a functional language or in a, uh, an OO language or even in a procedural language, it's not that the stuff that matters. The stuff that matters is, do you leave behind technical stuff that you should have dealt with before? And that's not by adding 17 layers of uh, abstraction or complexity, right? It is by making the code more clear. So I'll give you some real life examples of this, of companies that actually were on the, on the verge of coming to a total standstill. I actually have had companies that came to a standstill and that went, went bankrupt, right? It happens basically, and this is always the case. So some examples from my own experience. I used to work for this insurance company, and um, this insurance company is one of the richest insurance companies in the country, um, and I became the CTO. And, and the problem they had is that their software um, uh, was running on an on-premise mainframe, which is highly expensive. Running the mainframe alone costs a million euros per, per year, right? That is like 
too much pesos than I can count, probably. So it's, um, I don't know what that translates to. But so they need to get rid of the mainframe because they have an older version of the mainframe. They also couldn't uplo uh, upload newer versions of the operating system, which meant that it wasn't safe at all. So they needed to get rid of this thing. The problem was that they had code running in these ancient languages. And you're like, what is this code? You've probably never, this is a language called COBOL. By the way, half of the world runs on COBOL. About 80% of all code in production is written in COBOL, right? Um, take that into account once you write your next Python application or JavaScript application. COBOL is the language that makes the world run, actually. So this is not only COBOL, it's also in Dutch, <laughs> which makes it even harder. And it gets worse because they use all sorts of abbreviations. These are not Dutch words. These are abbreviations, which only the developers knew who built this, right? So they couldn't get even a younger generation of COBOL developers in, not that they exist, but by the way, if you want to wait, if you become really rich as a programmer, learn how to write COBOL, because the demand for COBOL developers will actually rise to the level that they become the highest paid developers in the world. So think about that. So, um, so this was an issue, right? So the problem was that most COBOL developers, as you know, are a bit older than we are, right? Or even older than I am. So they were about to retire. Now this is where typically organizations get into trouble. They have a lot of technical debt. Not even because the systems weren't good, because they were perfect. They were run perfectly. But the, the problem was they couldn't innovate anymore. They came to a standstill and they had to get rid of all this. Now my current client looks a bit like um, um, a typical street here in Manila. Um, <laughs> I, di I didn't take this picture here, but I could have done it, right? So it's, um, it's, it's basically an e-commerce company that has been rather successful. Uh, this is basically what their current platform looks like. Um, and they built it up over 15 years. They started as a small scale-up with having one deal on a web page 15 years ago. And it grew until I think we currently have like 1,500 deals. It's a deal platform. So we now have like 1,500 deals running every day. And they grew and grew and grew, and they built more systems, they added more systems to the landscape, um, and it became more complex and complex and complex. And as a result, they couldn't continue anymore. They had a mobile app. When I joined them two years ago, they had a mobile app that hasn't been updated since 2018. Right? That is where you make your money. Right? They couldn't um, um, change anything in the website anymore because it was totally stuck into a CMS system that contained much more than just uh, content. It also changed, had the, the user accounts. Can you imagine putting the user accounts in a CMS? That's not what a CMS is for, right? But they had it because they, at that point in time, it was the easiest solution. And they were sending data all around the place. So they got to a standstill too. So this is what happens basically. Technical depth. So this is adding new stuff to it. Eventually, you get some technical debt. And if you don't pay the interest to the technical debt, you get to the point that you're only repairing stuff. And you cannot innovate anymore. For companies that are commercial, they're doomed. They vanish. It happens every day, basically, right? It's all because you're lying on technical debt. Now, the question is, what's the actual problem here? And the actual problem, according to most companies, is we have monolithical systems. Monolithical systems suck. No, they don't. Not if they're well architected, written in a language that people can still write, if they have a decent design, if they do everything they need to do. There's nothing wrong with a monolith, by the way. Um, it does have the problems that, well, basically, if you want to release one small feature, you have to release the whole thing, right? Or even a landscape of big things, and that makes it complicated, right? So that is why we start building, breaking it down. So if you have, like, two the big systems, and this, this is actual true numbers, right? So the insurance company, they had 18 million lines of COBOL. 18 million lines of COBOL, right? They also have like 12 million lines of Java. And they needed to get rid of both because they were running on the mainframe. And they had no way out anymore. And then they called me and I solved everything. No, I didn't. But <laughs> Eventually we solved it with a big team in five years. But So the second problem that most companies come up with is legacy. Um, this is one of my favorite buildings in the world. It's the Pantheon in Rome. It's been standing here for 2,000 years plus. So it's basically the same age as the Batad rice fields, uh, the rice terraces, which are also pretty beautiful. But so this, this building is still in function. Why is it still in function? Because it was well built properly. And they updated it and maintained it and repaired it whenever it was necessary. What if your company, and this is your tech stack? 
Take this in, right? Now, you have to imagine, this is, this is an actual inquiry I did at the developers at the company I was working for at some point in time. So I said, so what's this, what, what are you guys using? And they came up with this. And um, this is too complex to maintain, right? You cannot maintain this. The, the group of developers that they had is smaller than the number of people that's sitting here, right? Um, so everybody has to know everything about this landscape. This company literally came to a standstill. They went bankrupt. They could not innovate anymore, right? That's the problem. Or dependencies. This is a nice chart, a nice chart of uh, one of my clients. They had um, each rectangle in this, uh, in this diagram is a system, by the way. So these are all systems talking to each other. Every time they wanted to release a single feature whatsoever, they needed to release the whole landscape all at once. Now, um, this is the, the public train transport company in the Netherlands. This is, by the way, their customer service department. <laughs> So it's, it's amazingly big. And they came to a standstill as well. They had to break through that. So this is my current client, right? So this is what they have. They have all sorts of customer-facing systems. Uh, they have a number of internal systems, and the number grows and grows. They have some, uh, some microservices running in Python. Um, some of these systems are in Python as well, by the way. Uh, we have clouds everywhere. And then we have lots of external parties that we talk to. Um, and the problem with it is, because it grew over year and year and year in 15 years' time, it actually, they had data everywhere. So all of these systems have their, their own databases, um, and all of these systems talk to it differently, which meant, as a result, when that they needed to sync the data between all these systems, and they're sending data everywhere, right? And this makes it impossible to even continue with it. So those are the problems that companies come up with. They always say, it's a technical problem. The developers are stupid. We should never have hired this CTO. Not me, by the way, but... Um, <laughs> I guess the previous one. But so this is what happens in reality. This is real life stories. Um, and, and the thing is, it's never the real problem. Because the real problem in all of these cases is actually the organization, right? It's never the developers, right? We are not, we are instrumental to this. It's companies that make the wrong decisions and thus never break through that, uh, to their complexity. Um, and, and as a result, they get stuck in technical debt, and that is what you call the innovative dilemma. Now, there's a nice chart for this, and this is the chart of the innovative dilemma. Let's say you're developing a product, and you're starting off nicely, and it works, and you add some features, you put it in the app stores, you put it out there, it becomes successful, you have a nice product, and then you start adding features, right? And you add more features, and your company grows, and the number of people you have grow and grow and grow, and eventually you get to a point that no matter what you add to the product, you get more clients. And this is very typical. It happens all the time, right? And, and, and then you get to the point that you, you need to reinvent yourself, right? You need to um, cross what is called the innovator's dilemma. Because if you don't do this, somebody else, some other company, will come up with the same idea based on much newer technology because they start later, or much smarter business ideas, and they'll build up their product meaning they're going to put you out of business. Might not even be on purpose, but it just happens, right? So can you remember, that you're too young probably for that, there was this thing called MySpaces that was extremely popular until something else came up. I think it was Facebook or something. And, and, and MySpaces totally vanished, right? If you would put your money on MySpaces, you'll be bankrupt by now. And this is a cycle that goes on and on. And the question is, how do you get past this innovator's dilemma? How can you reinvent yourself without breaking the current chain. Now, that's going to be the rest of the talk, right? So this is me again, but uh, did anybody miss the keynote this morning? Otherwise, I still have to explain who I am. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> so this is me, right? So feel free to connect on LinkedIn. A lot of you, of you are doing already. Um, and I work for this e-commerce company. This is the one with the complex data situation. Um, and, and what I'm telling you now, again, it's the same as this morning, is um, I'm just sharing what we've done, right? There is no silver bullet in this industry. There is no single technique, no refactoring technique, no whatever, that always works. It's situational, right? Every problem domain is different. Every company is different. Every organization is different. Every team is different, right? And it doesn't really matter whether it's written in Python or in Java or in JavaScript or whatever language you use, or whatever platform, whatever framework. This is a much bigger problem. So what can you do? So this is what we have done, right? So to make it even more complicated is while we are 
reconstructing what we're doing. So while we are breaking through the innovator's dilemma, the shop needs to stay open, right? Literally, in the case of the e-commerce company. But that goes for most companies, right? You cannot just say, I'm an insurance company, by the way, we're going to be offline for the next year. Um, if you have an insurance claim or if you want to get a new insurance policy, wait until next year. Sorry. It doesn't work like that, right? It never works like this. So we always come into situations, by the way, this is just around the corner of this picture, but it has nice colors, right? So uh, put it in. Um, uh, it's, it's always the case that it has to stay open. Um, and then comes into play something called Gaul's Law. And John Gaul says, he says, a complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that worked, right? So every big system that you have in place came from a simple system, and it evolved over time. So that means if the customer is saying, wait, um, you're going to build this new system, why can't you do it in six months? And then the answer you can give back is because you spent 15 years on building this, and you want me to rebuild it in half a year. It doesn't work like that. Because you cannot replace 15 years of ideas into six months of practice. So you have to do it differently. And John Dole is right. He says, a complex system designed from scratch never works and cannot be patched up to make it work. So don't start with a complexity rise. You have to start over with a simple working system. That's the key to getting beyond the, the, the innovator's dilemma. It's starting off really, really tiny small. With one thing, maybe, right? And that means you need to start taking really, really tiny steps. To explain the complexity a little bit more, I'm going to show you a framework which is called Kinefin. Have you guys seen this before? This is, when I first saw this, this was actually mind-blowing for me because it explains pretty well why it, our industry is so hard. So the Kinefin framework basically says you can be in four or actually five zones. This one's in the middle, but I leave that out. If you are in the clear zone, that means that for every problem that you encounter, there is a best practice, right? Um, simply put, um, if there's dishes on the sink, I need to put them in the dishwasher. I can wait until my kids do it. doesn't happen. Right. Don't know why. It doesn't happen. Right. So I best do it myself to save me all the frustration and stuff. And uh, They do other stuff. Right. So that's a clear best practice. If there's a best practice, do it. Right. The next zone is called the complicated zone. Now, in the complicated zone, you could say, for the problem at hand, there is a number of good solutions. If I need to implement uh, identity access management, there's a number of good solutions. Where you go to, go to Azure, you can go to AWS, to the Google Cloud, you can go to a number of vendors that are either like Okta, or you can build it yourself. By the way, that's, that's a bad alternative. Never do that, right? That's too complicated and too dangerous. So you need to figure out which one fits. So you need to do some analysis and then make a choice and implement it. It's doable. It's even planable, right? This is in the complicated zone. So the stuff that sits on the right in this diagram is the planable stuff. It's the known knowns, as I talked about this morning, right? But if you get to the other side of the diagram, it becomes much more complicated. If you are in a complex zone, that means the ideas you identify, the problems, the issues you identify, there is no best practice. There's not even a good practice. Most of the stuff that we do is in this zone, actually. Um, it means Okay, I have this sense of direction. I know where I want to go, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but I haven't got a solution yet. I don't know if there is a solution, but we're going to try and find it. So eventually, if you're lucky, and if you do the right experiments, and if you do the experiments right, solutions will emerge. That's the best you can do in a situation, right? And then it gets even worse. If you don't have a sense of direction, if you have no idea where you're going, then you start here. You start in the chaotic zone. In the chaotic zone, you have no idea where you're going. So the only thing you can do is experiment until you find a way where you want to go. When I first joined my current client, I went to the CEO and the CEO and I said, guys, what's your strategy? Where do you want to be in three years' time? Because where you want to be decides on where I'm going. So I'm trying to push them from here to here. Because if I have a sense of direction, I can find a direction in what to build. And they said, we want to create uh, bigger revenue with higher margins. It's an interesting strategy. <laughs> it's, um, I said, well, for me, that's basically the outcome of the strategy. So what do you want to do? What, do you want to go to, into new countries, explore new markets, or do you want to grow in the, in the home market? Do you want to have a website that we can change every day instead once a year? Because that allows you to do all sorts of marketing experiments, and maybe you can grow from there or create a higher conversion. 
And they needed to think about this, right? And um, they still haven't found a definitive solution, but we're getting there, right? So the funny thing is, in software development, most of us are on this side. As a result, usually there are no best practices or good practice to choose from. You need to find your own path. And this is exactly what happens all the time when you try to cross the innovator's dilemma. Now, <coughs> Les Kio, she found sort of like a, a nice set of guidelines to figure out when you are on the left side, right? So if it's a problem, we all know how to do this, right? L writing an if statement in Python. Even I could probably do this, right? Yeah, probably. <laughs> so it's that, that's definitely not in the, on the left side, right? Someone in our team has done this, right? So uh, we're now building a mobile app in React Native because we want everything to be on the React side because we have a small team. So I can afford to have it in Flutter, although I like Flutter. But um, has someone on the team already built a React Native app? Yes, I have a guy on the team who did that already. So we're using him to pilot it. Good, that saves a lot of time. Someone in our organization has done this. So maybe somebody on another team has done this already, right? Then it's still within reach. But then you get to the point where it gets hard, right? Is someone's done it, but not in this context. Or nobody's done this before. This happens, right? You might think, no, everything's done before. No, it doesn't. Because all the software vendors, uh, and I'm hoping not to offend software vendors in the room, software vendors come up with new features every day, right? Or it can be worse if you're in the JavaScript space. Well, JavaScript frameworks, if you take a nap in the afternoon, there's going to be a new framework when you wake up again, right? It's, um, it's changing all the time, really rapidly, right? So that means you get into problems that nobody solved before. And you come to the realization, if you're on the left side, there is a lot I don't really know. I have no idea about most of the stuff that my team is doing. It's a nice team because we have a lot of different specialities. We each have our own specialty. I have a big mouth. That's basically what I put in. But um, it's, it's, it's interesting because you can, tend to, you, you can help each other out, right? And you can learn much easier. Now, Dave Snowden, who's the author of the Kinefin framework, um, he's Welsh, he says, well, in a chaotic context, searching for right answers would be pointless, basically because there are no right answers. There are no right answers to life anyway, right? So he said, well, no manageable patterns exist, only turbulence. And he said, this is the realm of the unknowable. Again, it's pretty similar to what um, um, Rumsfeld said, right? This is the area of the unknown unknowns. But he also says that if you are in the chaotic domain, it is nearly always the best place for leaders to impel innovation. And that's nice, right? Because most of us like to be in innovative environments. And if you are on the left side of the diagram, you automatically are. So what do you do? Well, you experiment, right? It's a pretty similar message to what I gave this morning. Or it's the same message, actually. So what's an experiment, anyway? Uh, an experiment is a test done in order to learn something or to discover if something works or is true. Pretty simple definition, right? That is the point, right? You try something out. And you shouldn't be afraid to try stuff out. That's where it gets hard, by the way, right? Because in many teams, Many teams I've seen, not my own teams by the way, is um, people are afraid to try stuff out because what if it fails? Who are we gonna account for that, right? Who's getting the blame? Well, we do, right? We're the developers. So that means if you're in teams and you need to invent, or reinvent yourself, you need to pass the innovator's dilemma, you are in a career context, you need to experiment, you should have a safe environment to experiment in, right? If you don't have that safe environment, you're doomed. And this is what I mean by its problem is always the organization. Because it's usually the organization that does not want to change. They don't want people to make mistakes. They want them to be on the safe side. And thus, they hinder innovation. And thus, they have a serious issue with the innovator's dilemma. So it all falls together, right? So what's the point again? Oh, by the way, this is in the rice fields of Batat again. So you need to take small steps. So what do you do? Well, basically, I figured out four things about this stuff. So first of all, you should stop doing projects. Projects are the wrong metaphor for software development. They really are. We've tried for 50 years already. It doesn't work. Right? So stop doing that because they're too big. If you're in the chaotic zone, defining a project that should succeed in two years' time, it's way too big. You cannot do that. Right? You need to take the small steps. And you need to take that into account. 
So you need to start delivering individual features. A very predictable planning of when the project should end, basically after six months. And you can imagine that if you go like this, it will never end. I'll show you one more. It didn't end, by the way. So after like five months, he decided to hire more people. Now you know what happens if you hire more people in a, into a project that's already late, right? There's a thing called Brooks Law. Brooks Law says um, adding more resources, people, to a late project makes it even later. So don't do that, right? So it doesn't help because, well, you extend the project even more. It also becomes more expensive, right? So just make sure that if you're on the lights, left side of the Kinefin framework, you cannot estimate properly at this point in time. But what I do see is over time, and I've been in this industry a very, very long time, is that there is sort of an evolution going in, uh, in, in how we deal with cycles. It's with everything, right? Tools get better, cycles get shorter, people know more. We have additional tooling like ChatGPT, for instance, that helps us out. So the cycle's getting shorter and shorter. When I started, waterfall was basically the predominant, uh, the predominant model. You deliver everything once at the end of the product. That never worked, by the way, because it was a wrong metaphor. We took it from a wrong industry. Um, then we went into stuff like rational unit process. You might not have never heard for it. This was the worldwide leader in software development processes for years. Um, they had cycles from, let's say, four to six months. Then we got into DSDM, which is basically English, but the cycles went shorter. Then we went into Scrum. Cycles became two to four weeks. And then we went into beyond what is now known as Scrum, is we went into continuous delivery, meaning we deliver stuff on the same day, and then the only thing that business still has to do is look at it, push the button, and go into production. That is what is called continuous delivery. You can go beyond that. You can automatically push to production all the time. This is basically where my team is now. So every change that we make, every small feature that we do, we push it out into uh, production all the time. Right? We add new features every day. Small things, sometimes bigger things that lie around for a bit longer, but this is how we work. That means that the cycles have become much, much shorter, meaning they go into the length of the work item that you have. If we needed to add a button to the, to the hunt page to, uh, to allow a sound to ring when the next deal comes along, it took us four hours, you put it out in production, done. And that is the model that you're getting in, right, if you do this. And if you do this, your marketing people will love you because they can start new experiments any point in the day. Because could you, could you try this out and do some A-B testing on this? Maybe you put this button there, okay, sure, done, go. Literally, right? This is how it works. They're much happier with us than they were a year ago. So when you go into continuous delivery, um, just humble the order of the, of the continuous delivery book, right? So he says, well, if it hurts, do it more often uh, and bring the pain forward. What he's basically saying, I see a lot of companies, or that's my interpretation, I see a lot of companies that say, no, 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 we cannot deliver every day. Uh, uh, we need to deliver it only once a week. And then they can't deliver, right, because they're going slower. They say, no, 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 we're going to do it once every two weeks. And that grows and grows and grows until they get to a point that they say, yes, we're now going to do quarterly releases. Quarter releases are very, very expensive because you accumulate a lot of changes and you need to test them all at once, which is really expensive. And I've seen companies that went to one release of their software product, which is a commercial product, per year. That basically means you're out of business. They went out of business, by the way. They were bought by another company and they don't exist anymore. So if you go into uh, this continuous delivery stuff, uh, you need to do a bunch of things to make it work, right? Again, this is my team. Uh, uh, you need to do close collaboration and you need to deliver value continuously. So here's the point, and I already stressed that out a bit. If you have a big system, and you release every quarter, the amount of changes that you have is pretty big, which means it's hard to test because everything is related or correlated, uh, and it means releasing a new version is pretty hard. And if you do it again and again and again, you'll see that you get slower and slower and slower, which is even more expensive. Instead, you should probably, well, I'm gonna lose this one, you should probably look at it like this. Let's say you could split up your systems or your system into small parts. Let's say microservices. It doesn't have to be, but in small modules anyway, right? And you can release every one of them individually. You could do this, right? You could do all these small releases that you do all the time, and the deltas, the difference between the previous version of what you release and the current versions are only small, meaning that you only have to do a little test work to make it work. And you can do this forever, right? This is basically how you do it. One of the prerequisites to do this is that you start automating stuff. 
You need to automate your pipelines. You need to automate your testing. You need to even have your infrastructure as code, right? If anything breaks down at iBoot, it will automatically come back up. Whether that's an environment, whether that's a database, whether that's a service, whether that's a bunch of services, they all come back automatically because, well, we scripted it out, basically. So, Edwards Deming says, um, he says, seize dependence on inspection uh, to achieve quality. He's basically saying, don't do code reviews. <laughs> don't do feature branches because you're too late, right? If you want to shorten your cycles and you need to, um, you're going to go beyond that. You should leave that go, right? Instead, invest in full CI CD. This is one of our pipelines. This is an actual picture. I'm not sure if it shows up clearly. But these are the phases that my, go, my code goes through when I, uh, when I uh, push it to the repo, right? So it builds it, um, it actually formats it, it lints it, then it starts testing it, so all my unit tests run. Then Sonar comes across it to, um, to check for code quality. Then we publish it, uh, um, and we put it into a Docker container. Automa this is all automatic, right? Um, then it gets deployed to the development environment, basically our, our own test environment. We run the API test on it. If they go OK, we deploy it to acceptance, the same uh, Docker container. Then we run a load test and a performance test on it. And then we deploy it to production. And this whole pipeline takes about, well, depending on which service we took on it, between five and seven minutes, right? Yeah. <laughs> if I had the time, I could actually show you. Unfortunately, I don't have that time. And we split up our code bases into really tiny stuff, right? We have about 150 code bases at this point in time. They all have the same architecture, the one I showed you this morning. So one for each of our services, one for each of our micro apps, one for each of our workers. And they all run with every change we do, right? It does also mean, if you do this and you, you deploy all these small parts, that you actually have to test them into an integration all the time, right? So that's why they deploy to an environment where we, done, we, we run the API test and we run the full web test and we do a full load on everything before we put it into production. But it goes to production automatically. I actually should have started this talk by, by pushing something in a pipeline so you could actually see that it got into production. So that means also your infrastructure goes into being code. That, this is necessary. Um, so this is a piece of our pipeline. Um, this is literally our pipeline, by the way. So everything is code. Every new pipeline is a copy of this pipeline. Or actually, it, it pulls it out and it, it, it generates the actual code. That also means that all your tests need to be automated. Um, if I go to test conferences, they're usually quite sad if I tell this, because they like actually pushing buttons themselves and writing it down in Excel sheet. But that's a very long feedback cycle, right? So you don't want to do this. You want the feedback automatically. So that means all your tests need to run automatically. So instead of saying, I have very little unit tests, but you know what? I have a lot of manual tests, and we test the end-to-end -end scenarios using some web framework like Cucumber or um, Selenium or whatever you do, um, uh, but it should be the other way around. Right? You should really rely on a vast amount of unit tests, um, still a lot of, of API tests, which are still easy to change. The scenario tests are much harder to change. So if you have a lot of those, you're also going to get stuck. And manual testing, very, very little to none. Right? So testing takes place continuously in the pipeline. Right? You see basically this. We have unit testing, syntax validation, linting, uh, static code analysis, security tests, integration tests, end-to-end -end performance tests, the whole shebang. It all runs with every pipeline we start. Now that is where you need to go if you want to go fast, if you want to um, go across the innovator's dilemma. So let's talk about Teams a bit, right? This is um, uh, one of my favorite topics. I'm actually trying to write a book about this. I have a full written manuscript. But I'm writing so much code these days that I have a hard time finishing the book, actually. So it's, um, it probably is going to never come out. So this is the realization, right? Developing software is complex. Complex as in Kinefin complex, right? Um, again, right, um, um, if you have a large um, um, set of, of tooling and techniques, you get to the point that you cannot handle it yourself. I should have put these slides in the wrong order, right? If this still is your stack, you're doomed, basically. So, um, Edgar Dijkstra, a famous just, uh, a computer scientist, he said in, I think in 1984, he said, the programmer has to be able to think in terms of conceptual hierarchies that are much deeper than a single mind ever needed to face before. What he's basically saying is that we, as developers, we are in the most complex industry there is out there compared to any other industry. And you might not believe it, but, well, well just look into all the new JavaScript frameworks coming out, right? If you can keep up with that, you're pretty smart. 
So um, I can't keep up with it anyway. So the thing is, you cannot do this alone. Right? There is no other way than to collaborate. Managers who still think that people should work on an individual basis are dead wrong. And these managers should avoid tech, right? Let them go into business administration or something else boring. But um, oh, I cannot say that probably, right? Has <laughs> <laughs> anybody of you a business administrator? No. So the thing is, you need to le learn to work together, right? It's everywhere software development is, is we are prone to be working together because it's too complex. So this is a nice picture I took at a, at a really good jazz concert I was in Amsterdam. And, and you see these people, they're all fine magicians, but the music is best when they play together, or maybe in subsets of those. Um, and I took the name of this idea from a Dutch jazz collective called the New Cool Collective. And this is a big band, basically. But what the big band does is they play together all along, right? They play the same music piece, but they also split up into smaller groups. And the smaller groups take on different songs. Like if they want to play a jazz song, they need to have like three to four people. If they want to play a soul song, you probably need a singer and a bass player and a pianist and stuff. So in different ensembles, they tend to work together. Now, I mapped this to software development. I said, well, basically, if you have a collective, it basically means you have a whole lot of people working in the same business domain or in the same area together having all the skills that you might need to deliver the product. Could be anything, ranging from any programming language into somebody who knows about clean architecture, but also people knowing about market research, maybe about databases or ERP systems or the one that you have, or um, a QA person or UX people or whatever you might need, or product owners for that matter, you might need to push the product out. And with that group, and I can show you a picture of a group in action. This is a group of around 20 to 25 people making software for the Dutch railways. Um, and they come together every day and they look at how to split up the work again. And the thing is, this works best, working in such collectives, if you're allowed to split it up even smaller work, right? So we need to talk a little bit about autonomy. Now, I only have like eight minutes left, so it's got to be fast. Um, but I'll do it anyway, right? So. Um, Autonomy is a pretty tough thing. So everybody always preaches about autonomy. Right? Like people need to be autonomous to do the work. The problem is for most people is that autonomy is really, really hard. Right? It is, for most people, way out of their comfort zone. Right? So what I see with teams that are not used to being fully autonomous is that if you say to them, like, you're now autonomous and, and uh, you can make your own decisions. Right? You decide on what's best for us. And the first thing they'll ask me is, what do you want us to do? And I'm like, that's not my problem. You solve that, right? It's your responsibility. I have a developer on my team, and she wasn't totally used to this, actually. So when we came into the current company, um, she said, Sander, do you want me to work on the ERP system, or do you want me to work on a new platform today? I said, well, figure it out yourself. She said, yeah, I don't know. I said, well, you better know. It's your responsibility, right? It's your life. I'm not going to decide what you do today. That's too low level. I have no time to do that. It's your responsibility. Right? Decide for yourself. And she said, okay, I'll work on the ERP system today. What do you want me to do tomorrow? <laughs> it took her a while, but now she's fully okay with it. Right? So for most people, being highly autonomous is very, very difficult. And it's hard to teach people to be autonomous. It's basically like this. right? If you need to draw an owl, I can tell you that well, it's probably two circles, and then you figure out what the rest is. Right? This is extremely tough. And autonomy at work um, actually means they decide what to do, when to do it, and how to do it, up to some boundaries, but those are really wide usually. And it means outcome over output. Right? It means we build stuff with value, not with an amount of uh, lines of code. That doesn't really matter, right? Um, and it works when you can agree with the rest of your team. So you need to do a lot of communication with the rest of the team. Um, and um, it's not limited to working 9 to 5, because for most people in this industry, that doesn't really work. It also doesn't mean that self-organization, which is a result of this, is like mandatory fun. This is a, a picture that my girlfriend took. This is her leg. You're now looking at my girlfriend's leg. Um, and um, she's in an e-commerce company, another one that I work for, interviewing for a high management position. And she's in this room that is full of little balls up to her knees almost. Right? This is nothing to do with autonomy and self-organization. A lot of companies mistake that for, we have a pool table, so you're autonomous. No, that has nothing to do with it. But we have a ping pong table. 
also has nothing to do with it. We have free beer on Thursday afternoon. Doesn't really matter. It's cool. Uh, I like it, but uh, it has nothing to do with autonomy, right? You need to move beyond that. And the thing that I worked out over time, and it took me a long time to realize this thing, is that autonomy works best with fewer rules. Now, I might understand that this might be different in, in your culture than in mine. In, in my culture, we break rules all the time. That's what we love to do in the Netherlands, right? It's how we roll, basically. So for us, this is slightly easier than for the rest of the world. But we're weird. So um, this is a, a square not too far from where I live. And what they did at some point in time, they removed all the traffic signs. They removed all the signs from the road as well. And, and what happened is all the bicycles and all the, um, all the cars and the trams and the buses and whatever goes there in Amsterdam, they needed to figure out for themselves how to deal with the other traffic. You know what that takes? It takes communication. It takes that you look into the eyes of the driver that's also coming onto the road, onto the crossroad uh, at the same time. That means you need to figure out who goes first. And you will, actually, right? If there's persons crossing the, uh, the, the crossover, well, you let them go. If there's a person coming really fast in a BMW, you let them go. Right? That's what BMWs are probably for. I don't know one, by the way. I don't want to own one. But. So with fewer rules, people need to communicate. So that's what I'm doing with my teams. I take away the rules. Right? It's like um, the female developer that I just talked about, not saying to her what she needed to do, which the previous manager did, it, it makes her think, right? It makes her need to communicate with the rest of the team, see where they are, where they are working on, and how to do that. So we came up with a small strategy for this. And this is the, um, the topic that I want to share with you the most, actually. Uh, this is really close to my heart. So the question that I ask my team all the time, and I don't have to ask it anymore because they know already, is what small problem are we solving today? So stuff coming out of the tech board, just the, the big stuff, we can split it up ourselves. We don't have to tell other people outside of our team how to do that. We know how to do this. So we break it up together, and then we decide on how to do it. Who does what, when does what, how they work together. It's all team decisions, right? I decide basically nothing except for Oh, uh, can we get a license for 5,000 euros for something? And I'm like, okay, that's basically what I do, right? So, and I write the code. But, um, so every problem is interesting because the thing is, if you look into the stuff that is coming out of the tech board, um, but also the stuff that comes out of regular backlogs, um, none of the items actually require the same skill set. So you could have one item that requires, what is this? An architect, a QA, a backender, and, and a domain expert. You can see this is a Java developer because he has a ponytail. Um, and um, um, uh, she's, not a, she's not the domain expert. She's my girlfriend, but she posts for the picture. So, but anyway, well, she well, actually was a domain expert here. So this is one item that you could work on. That means other people on the team could work together on, let's say, uh, a combination of an architect and a front-end developer. They could build something too. He laughs out loud because he knew I was saying front-end developer. He's not. He's a Java developer too. Um, he doesn't like front-end, actually. So here's what we do. And this is what we do continuously. And we don't even do it consciously anymore. This is totally in our transcend state, right? Um, what we do is this. Every morning or every day that we need to pick something new, we pick something new. And, and we do that ourselves, meaning we are now going to work on adding French as a language or making the languages dynamically. That means a lot of the people on the team will actually be able to contribute to that. So we pick an item and we say, OK, listen, I'm going to work on this. Then other people say, you know what, I'm coming out and help you. Or you can ask for other people to help you because they know more about it than you do and you want to learn something about it. So that's what they do. Um, they form this small team. They discuss the item at hand. If they're online, usually they do it in a call. We usually use Slack for that. Um, or they sit together, like here. Um, they do the work. Um, they deliver the work. They check the code in. And they disband. And the same process uh, repeats over and over again. That means for the longer time, I'll show you some examples first. right? So. Um, this is an example. This is um, basically uh, an ops guy with a developer um, sitting together to do some work. Here you see typically two developers. Um, they're old, so there must be Java developers. Um, and, a, and a tester. Of course, the tester had to stand, right? That's your punishment for being a tester. Um, and um, this is another one. This is two developers working on something. And here you see a software architect and a developer. You can see the difference because the developer thinking, mm, I'm not sure if it works. And the architect says, let's pray for it to work. <laughs> so, 
So, so it, it continuously evolves, right? This is a technique that, that you work together with different people almost every day. You work on different things every day. You can work on the stuff that challenges you because you want to learn more about it, or you can get back into your comfort zone and do stuff that you actually are, are fond of and like to do. So one of my developers, she's very good in our ERP system written in Python, and um, she loves to do that. She doesn't like to work on the front end, so she never chooses front end work. It's just not her thing, and that's okay. Right? Everybody has their own speciality or stuff they want to do. Communication becomes really easy because you usually only communicate with the people that you're working on at this particular moment in time. So if I work with two other developers on a particular item, um, that's usually who I communicate with. And I don't have to talk to people six levels up because I just do the work. It also becomes less relevant where you are because I can literally hop on my machine now. What time is it in the Netherlands? It's now nine in the morning, so they're now in the stand-up actually. So I could literally open up my laptop and start working with them if I want to. I don't have to be in Amsterdam per se. I like Amsterdam by the way, but that's not really relevant. <laughs> so also, all the stuff about creating low level estimates, about doing retros, about doing sprint evaluations, they don't exist anymore basically because there's no need to do it at the lower level. And if you deliver all the time, like tons of times per day, why would you actually have a sprint anymore, right? It saves the, the abundance of those items again. So that also really helps. So it's, it's actually a whole bunch of really interesting techniques that help you work through the smaller work items on a daily basis. And there's actually nothing to arrange, right? So the CEO of the company said to me when I, when I left for the Philippines, he said, who's going to take control of the team? And I said, well, the team. Yeah, 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 but who's in charge? Well, the team is as they are always, right? They're also in charge when I'm there. Because I don't make the decisions, we make the decisions, basically. And you know, that's actually a really fun way of working. So, um, one of the banks in the Netherlands, and then I'll conclude it up, I'll wrap it up, um, is um, they, they started to do this too. Like two years ago, one of their development managers saw my talk on microteams, and he said, oh, I'm gonna try this out. And at one point in time, I posted a post on, um, on LinkedIn saying, uh, uh, people ask me if this would scale. And I'm like, I don't know. And I'm, I personally don't care much because I like to work for smaller companies. I don't care about big banks with 1,500 teams. And then the ING, they actually responded. They said, you know what? We do this too now. We scaled it up to about 150 teams and it still works. I'm like, okay, cool. Maybe I should write the book now. But <laughs> that's the book I haven't finished, guys. So uh, maybe I'll do that in the future. So, um, what? Next slide. Um, to wrap it up really shortly, um, in, in a retail, right? Let's do the only retail that I'll do this year. Um, is we are not in a very linear situation in software development, right? We don't solve problems that everybody else has solved before. We solve new problems all the time. As a result, we're on the left side in this diagram. As a result of that, it's hard to plan this stuff, right? If you're doing COBOL for 40 years, you're on the right side, that will work. You can plan that, right? But if you're on the left side, and most of us are, it's hard to plan. So you need to start surviving that dilemma by going smaller, basically, by delivering features instead of projects. So make it small by going shorter on your cycles. See what you can cut out, right? And see how often you can go to delivery. And the more you can do that, the better you get at it, right? That's what Jess Humble basically says. Also, with smaller teams. So get the larger group out on the domain that you're working on and figure out how to work together with different people every day, because it really works. And the last thing, that's the item I didn't touch today, is you can, it helps if you build small components, if you are able to deliver all those components individually into production, using all sorts of automated tooling, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And basically, you are then set to solve one problem per day. And that's the goal, right? Um, by the way, if you do this, you can never stop learning, and you should never forget to have fun on this, uh, and with that, I'm again four minutes over time. That must be my default modus, I guess, today. So um, thank you for listening in, um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Hello, uh, it's Mitch. Um, I have a question about estimates. So you mentioned that we shouldn't estimate the low level, and we should estimate at a higher level, like an epic level or a feature level. Um, how? how? How do you do that? Yeah, how do you say that, like, oh, this epic will take three weeks? Um, three weeks would even be short, but um, so what we do is basically when something new comes into the tech board um, and we need to know more or less what time it will take, right? We'll take that item, which is usually a one sentence thingy, 
at a very high level usually, we take it into the tech team and we look at it and we're like, okay, we probably need to do this and this and this. So more or less it'll take like, I don't know, four weeks with three people. It's, it's, that is the detail level that we get at. It's not more detailed. We don't structurally write it down because it never exactly is right. So that's, that's why you should not estimate at a lower level. It takes a lot of time and it doesn't add value. So if you do it in a ballpark figure way, saying, okay, four weeks, and, and, and the thing is, people know that you cannot estimate properly. That will be measurement instead of estimation, right? It's still an estimate. So um, coming back to the tech board, saying um, it will take us probably four weeks with four people. It's detailed enough for managers to make the decision, of which I'm one, by the way, uh, to make the decision to either do this or not. And that's the only thing you need to know. Further breakdowns, they're not of interest of the rest of the company, right? It's, that's what you do. Well, probably with uh, the business owner, you look at it together, you sit around the table, you look at it that, and you get the work. But estimation on a too low level anywhere is very, uh, very much not insightful because it, it's never right, right? So people, uh, so by the way, one tip if you do estimates, oh, this is a golden tip. If you do estimates, always make them with two, two numbers behind the comma, right? Never say it takes eight weeks. Always say it takes 8.14 weeks. <laughs> you know why? It's reliable. People think, oh, they actually calculated, so it must be right. <laughs> <laughs> Works, actually. Right. So don't estimate at that level. Right? So it's a okay, thank you so much. I'll try welcome. that. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Franz. I've worked on uh, B2E fintech companies the uh, majority of my career. So meaning it's very sales-led growth type of business, not product-led. Um, I res uh, Also, uh, first of all, thank you for the talk. I resonate with a lot of things that you mentioned. Like you, I focus on economies of speed rather than scale. I've done away with project management for most of the instances except for operational changes, things like that. In terms of my engineering teams, Dora metrics were already on the high elite side, but it, it still frustrates my team because we could deliver the product roadmap on time, on budget, and everything. But the outcome is, is still not there. Because, the business outcome is still not there because since we're sales-led, a, a sales cycle could be like three months, 18 months, so on and so forth. So you build all this stuff, and then you have to wait a few months to figure out whether it actually works or not. Yeah. So in terms of feedback cycle, we are constrained by the sales team, and by nature, sales team is focused on economies of scale. Yeah. So even though we go as fast as we can, we have to wait like three, six months before we figure out if yeah. it actually works. So basically, um, speed is not your biggest problem. Yeah. So why would you optimize for speed then? So far, that's the only thing that I have control over, which is the engineering speed. But in yeah. terms of, out, we could deliver the roadmap. But in terms of outcome, like increase the ARR by 3x, reduce the NRR, reduce the, cake, the CAC payback, things like so, that. So what, but if, um, if the sales team slows you down, right, why just not wait on to, build, to build something until they literally come back with it, right? So until they've sold it, because you're fast enough apparently. So that means um, you don't necessarily have to build up front before they sell it. You can also sell it, b uh, build it while they sell it or after. You could just turn the cycle around, I right. suppose. I would prefer if the sales team will sell something that hasn't been created. Yeah. That's normally something founders can do, but a sales team, from at least from my experience, could rarely do that. If any, the product management team would have to do that themselves. Oh, the sales team yeah. rarely does it. Put them in charge, right? So you, you can just say, we're going to stop building stuff now because you haven't sold it yet. Just we're going to wait. We're going to drink a lot of coffee and tea and um, do a lot of pool and ping pong and whatever. Uh, go see a movie until you come up with something that we can really build that really adds value. My concern there is that it puts my product team in jeopardy. Like, oh, so why do we need this product team? Like, doesn't make any money. That, that is a proper question, by the way. It's, um, so, so if you build stuff that they haven't sold yet, you're never sure that they actually will sell it, right? So, yeah, so yeah. That's, that's a tough situation to be in. I, w I would probably try, but it, there's no silver bullet here, right? So I would probably try to slowly turn it around to make sure that you're actually only building what they actually sell. Makes it a lot easier. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Ted. Um, I have a question about continuous delivery. So that means deploying to production once or even more than once a day. Yeah. Um, 
How do you make sure that you don't burn out the developers in that kind of pace? Because they decide on the speed. There is no, we don't have deadlines. We haven't got a single deadline. We deliver when we think it's done. So that means that the developers will actually work at the pace that suits them. So there's no, because we don't do estimates, so there's no deadlines. Mm. So we, the, people can never say, yes, but it's supposed to be finished by Wednesday. Well, we didn't promise that, right? So what do you get Wednesday from? It's like and not having these estimates actually is a much bigger cultural change than you think because not having estimates means there's no deadline. Usually what people do is they say, um, we estimated at two weeks. An estimate means on average a thing like this would probably take us two weeks. What managers will do is they say, oh, okay, it's done in two weeks. No, it's not. It's possibly done in two weeks. Could also be three, could also be four, could also be one. Right? That's what an estimate is about. But um, people make it into deadlines. And once you get into deadlines, you get stuck. Um, so we have never got an issue with burning out people because we're not going that fast. We are also, um, not sure where the gentleman is, we're not optimizing for speed. We don't do that actually. Speed is not our highest issue. The biggest issue that we're trying to solve is that we're shortening the feedback cycles as short as we get because that will make the product better really, really rapidly. So it's not about uh, speed of development, it's about um, increasing, uh, of creating value in a sustainable way. Makes sense. So we don't burn out, actually. Actually, it's quite, it's actually quite relaxed what we do. Occasionally, we put ourselves to a deadline ourselves, like with the hunt page, it needs to be done because the hunt is going on. But we always have a fallback, right? If, if we weren't ready for the hunt, we would have run the previous version. It still works. So that's, it. there's no deadlines. Welcome.